So we're going to be chatting today about, uh, to start, cerebrovascular disease, and we'll cover um, this as broadly, uh, yet relatively quickly as possible. Again, um, two-year neurology fellowship in one hour. So which of the following is not a risk factor for ischemic stroke? A, migraine, B, low birth weight, C, family history, or D, depression? Luckily for you, D, depression. So I have nothing to disclose. So what we're going to review is uh, just a brief review of vascular anatomy of the, of the cerebrovasculature, talk about ischemic stroke and TIA, uh, including the acute presentation and treatment, common stroke syndromes, pathophysiology, epidemiology and risk factors, diagnosis, and secondary prevention. As well, we'll speak about hemorrhagic stroke, focusing on the two most common being intraparenchymal and subarachnoid. So stroke is an abrupt onset of a persistent neurological deficit due to a focal vascular cause, and that does not separate out ischemic and hemorrhagic, both of which are included in that definition. The term apoplectic has been historically used, meaning an abrupt onset of a neurological deficit. Far and away, ischemic is uh, much more common at 85%, hemorrhagic being only 15. Breaking down stroke syndromes, this is one of the larger studies that's looked at a breakdown of, of presenting percentages of stroke. Far and away, the most common, again, is within the thrombotic or ischemic uh, category, is cryptogenic stroke. So looking for any type of a cause and being unable to find one. Cardioembolic is categorized when there's actually a well-identifiable source of, of embolic stroke coming from the heart. Atherosclerosis, when it is identifiable on vascular imaging. And then small vessel disease or lacunar strokes based on their location and size. And you can see hemorrhagic stroke makes up 15% with a breakdown of intraparenchymal being 10% and subarachnoid being 5. Other types of stroke which don't fall firmly into these categories at 5%. So we have now two definitions of what is a transient ischemic attack. Temporary focal neurological deficit, presumably related to ischemia of the brain and or the retina, which the symptoms clinically present. And the classic definition, as all of us I think have learned it, is less than 24 hours. And uh, modern neuroimaging, better understanding of the pathophysiology, has led to a contemporary definition which says less than one hour and or without evidence of infarction on imaging. So this is a, a relatively new idea, when I say new, back in the early 2000s, but it's an important concept. Most of the uh, individuals who will present with uh, stroke-like symptoms lasting more than one hour typically have evidence of an infarction. So to review, these are our uh, major blood vessels supplying the brain. You have your internal carotids. This is an MR angiogram with uh, reconstruction for three-dimensionality. You have your internal carotids, which come up to supply your middle cerebral artery as well as your anterior cerebral arteries, vertebral arteries, each of which supply the pathway. This is a very normal MR angiogram. I chose this one purposely that there's no pathology. This is a top-down view of the same person. Um, again, this is the internal carotids coming up here. You see the middle cerebral. Hard to identify on this are the anterior cerebral arteries and then the PCAs or posterior cerebral arteries coming off here at the top of the basilar. To review common stroke syndromes, with all of these, uh, clearly th these are not complete on most presentations. So everyone with a left MCA stroke does not present with this entire list of symptoms. So if they have a complete proximal MCA stroke, they certainly can. Uh, but they're often patchy and or partial MCA infarcts. So for the left, you would anticipate contralateral hemiparesis, uh, sensory loss, a, a right homonymous hemianopia, meaning, a, a, again, a, a partial loss of vision or a complete loss of vision in both hemifields of vision, so in the both right sides of each eye. For MCA infarctions, unless they are complete, these are often sort of partial or crescentic, meaning that part of the vision is lost in that hemifield, but it's incomplete. So sometimes they can be a bit elusive. Itonic gaze deviation to the left. This is involving the frontal eye fields. You typically look at the, a destructive lesion. So we'll look toward the left with a left MCA stroke. A language deficit, be it uh, motor or sensory aphasia, or both, and a hemi neglect or an incomplete neglect when they have an inattention of that side, but are aware that it exists. With the right MCA, it would again be the contralateral side. Uh, same list of symptoms with the differences being uh, aprosodia, which is uh, an inability to control intonation of voice and or understand intonation of voice. Uh, you'll often hear people describe them as talking as if uh, English is a foreign language, lo losing the nuances and understanding of the ups and downs in, vo in voice tone. And anagnosia is common, where there is a, an absence of understanding that they actually have a severe deficit and they're unaware of this. And, and this is, and to some element, a degree of inattentiveness. With a left PCA stroke, you would anticipate a more complete hemianopia, amnesia because of temporal lobe involvement, 
a lexia without a graphia, so an inability to read without an inability to write, and a right hemisensory loss due to thalamus involvement. With a right PCA stroke, you would again anticipate contralateral vision loss and a left sensory loss due to thalamus. In the vertebral basilar system, the posterior circulation typically would produce diplopia, causing uh, an infarct anywhere in the course of the medial longitudinal fasciculus, dizziness and or vertigo, a loss of consciousness due to basilar infarction or ischemia, ataxia and or dysarthria due to cerebellar or cerebellar outflow fibers, nausea, dysphagia, and, and or bilateral vision loss. And this, is, uh, this can present with a maintenance of wakefulness but complete infarction of uh, bilateral occipital lobes. This would be what would be considered a top of the basilar syndrome. The ophthalmic artery, uh, which again is still considered a stroke syndrome even though it is not brain, would produce a monocular vision loss or a single vision loss or what's described as amaurosis fugax, which is a sense of a curtain or darkening which drops over the eye due to retinal ischemia. Of the penetrating end arteries, and these are what we call small vessel syndromes, uh, these include a clumsy hand with dysarthria, pure motor or pure sensory strokes, or more commonly a mixed motor and sensory stroke with no other cortical findings. Ischemia is a time-dependent cascade. It begins with a decrease in energy production due to a loss of blood flow and a loss of oxygenation. This secondarily produces an excitotoxic effect with overstimulation of local glutamate receptors. There is an abrupt rush of intraneuronal uh, sodium, chloride, and calcium, and this produces a subsequent mitochondrial failure and subsequent cell death. There's a concept that I want you to be aware of called the ischemic penumbra. So in any given stroke syndrome, there is a presumed area of dense infarction, which is presumably irreversible. Surrounding that is often a larger area of, quote, brain at risk. And these are what we call perfusion scans, which are done with CT. We do these standard on each patient who comes in with a stroke within an early time frame. The first two images on the left, one is a time to perfusion, and the other one is a mean transit time, where we're able to measure how quickly contrast enters the brain. The third image there is a reconstructed estimate of what areas are actively infarcted and presumably irreversibly injured, and that would be the red area. Surrounding that is an area of relative reduced perfusion, which is at risk of subsequent infarction if blood flow is not re uh, resolved or regained. So you can see in the two left images that, relatively speaking, the left temporal lobe region, which you can see very easily on the right, has a reduction in, uh, in blood flow and an increased transit time and time to perfusion. So blue being longer period of time to, to get blood flow. So I don't anticipate that anyone here would be uh, acutely assessing people in the emergency room for stroke, but it is important to understand the concepts. The first thing that we need to do is establish a timeline of, of symptom onset. And this needs to be as precise as possible. Unfortunately, many people sleep at night, and that estimates one third of the day. So it's not uncommon that someone will go to sleep feeling otherwise well, and we take that as their last known well time you have to presume that the stroke occurred the moment they fell asleep. Unfortunately, that's probably not the case, but for safety reasons, we have to use that as, as a time of onset. You then have also other folks with a precise time sitting at the kitchen table and their spouse sees their face droop. That's a lot easier to determine. The reason that timing is important is because we have to determine whether or not they are eligible for particular interventions, and the safety of those interventions hinges upon an accurate time frame. Initial examination is really to emphasize lateralized hemispheric findings and or brainstem findings. So the subtle nuances of a neurological exam get thrown out the window, uh, and we're not pulling out our feathers and using our pinwheels, but we're acting pretty quickly. There is a universally accepted scale called a stroke scale or the NIH stroke scale. Uh, this is very well known by most emer emergency room physicians as well as neurologists, and uh, it really focuses on the key points to determine how severe a stroke is, and these do estimate outcome following stroke in terms of the initial presentation. Focuses on level of wakefulness and consciousness, content and function of language, speech ability, ocular motor function, visual field deficits, facial and limb power, coordination, sensation, and the evidence of extinction or neglect.